Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome trainer Brad Cox to the stage. First of all, belated happy birthday. Thank you. And congratulations on the steak win yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> Speak up. They want to hear you. Um, first, I would like to direct your attention to the infield screen. We've put together a couple of highlight races. There's so many to choose from, first of all. These are just, we could only show three due to time constraints, but these are the couple that I've chosen. We call them cool. Those hearts that have no scars to show. The ones that never do let go. And risk the tables be and they're off in a fairgrounds handicap. Good start for Pumpkin Rumble, along with Roman Approval. There's the party, same as Chocolate Ride, as they vanish across the course here in the early going. And it's Chocolate Ride, just lean, departing on the outside. Pumpkin Rumble on the orange cap in the front ranks. Wireless Future held up with the rail on the heels of Pumpkin Ride. And to the outside, Susanna Red Millionaire Spring King is in forward in place. Same as Roman Approval takes back. Mark was covered for the rail. And the Comic River is the last one out of the stretch. Chocolate Ride will be here for Fauvon Giroux. We call them strong. Close to the quarter in 24. One per second with Chocolate Ride and Weeds. Departing by three quarters of a length. St. Martin the string team, third on the outside. The James Graham in touch with Puck Levide, going up the back of the fort. Wireless Future saving ground. And between horses, Pumpkin Hubble, right there in the thick of it, too. Same as his wider route through the course. Here's Roman Approval. Keen up the inside there for Javier Castellano. Held up Roman Approval. Puck Levide score for longs from home. And from Mark, who's running to the fourth path then. The Thumbit River Trail still. 49 and faint this for Chuck Levide. As they traverse the far side of the course, the three for longs from home. It's Chocolate Vibe and departing. Continues to zero in on Chocolate Vibe. Strengthening his fight there too. Wireless Future hugs the rail. On the outside is Same As looking to quicken into these splits. Pumpkin Rumble to three horses. Blar from the white cap is fan wide. Cutting the corner, Roman approval land. Potomac River was last as they straightened. Three quarters. One of the 13 and four for second. Chocolate Vibe now set down by Fawon Giroux. A furlong to go. It's Chocolate Vibe who bumps the lead to three. Departing fully extended. Roman approval. Google now pulls out with the linking. It's chocolate ride. Chocolate to get out of control. Wanting to fly higher and higher. I can't abide standing outside the fire. Standing outside the fire. And they're off in the 2016 Azari Stakes. Life from the center, Sarah life. Sis wins the break with High Dollar survive. Woman moving up from the outside. These two are quick. Streamline taken in hand to race in third. And there's Florent Giroux riding the favorite untappable. She's fourth while in the clear. Kiriaki is racing on in fifth, followed by Michelle. Two in front of Theogeny. And the stretch runner, Cole Pat, is last of all and about 10 lengths off the lead as they run around the opening turn. Taking over the lead, Joe Bravo and High Dollar Woman by a length and a quarter. Untappable is a bit keen here, throwing her head about while racing in second. Sarah Sis is reined back to run third. Streamline is on hold while fourth in front of Michelle in fifth. Then Kiriaki, not asked for much by Mario Gutierrez, only four and a half lengths off the lead. It's a stretch of another three and a half to Theogeny and two more to the trailer, Cole Pat. She's tugging under Rocco and she's better than nine lengths off the pace after the opening half mile went in 47 and four. Less than half a mile to go in the Azarian. Sarah Sis down on the inside, pokes the neck back in front. Three wide untappable, yet to be given the green light. From between horses, it's High Dollar Woman. From behind the speed, here's Kiriaki into fourth. Then to the inside and streamline, no place to go. Michelle on the outside, two better than Theogeny, and Cole Pat starts to catch up as they run around the far turn. Florent Giroux, an untappable, now set sail for the money. They're a quarter of a mile from home, and they're in the front. On the outside, Kiriaki trying to come after her, and streamline off cover and into the clear. Three sixteenths to go. Giroux shakes up the reins on untappable. We'll have to deal with a streamline on the outside. Back third is Sarah Sis, then Cole Pat. Rocco weaving through traffic with the stretch runner in deep stretch. Untoppable is all out. Here comes Cole Pat along the rail. Cole Pat's got her. It's Cole Pat in time. Untappable outrun in the stretch for second. It's close third. Either streamline or theogeny in 144 and two. And the shade it always comes with getting burned.
But you got to be tough when consumed by this And so off from the TwinSpires.com for Louisiana Derby. And Kenny, my boy, with an outdoor to lead by Cisco Perez. Battery is right there, too. Cutrunner with the rail. The outside Uncle Walker, Jasmine Jam, and Forever Mo as they make their way for the first turn. Led by Candy Those My Boy, Jasmine Jam, and Uncle Walker is right there. Gunrunner fourth at the inside of Candy My Boy. This is Dazzling Jim, by the way, who won, broke the maiden, won an allowance. This was his stakes debut in the Louisiana Derby, by the way. There's the break of a length and a half to Conquest Windy City. And driven back to last and settled by Corey Mallory. Mo Tom is running in 10th. And His for board, that in 23 and 2 per second. They go off the back and it's Kenny, my boy. They didn't dash him jam by Pink for the court. Gunner right there. Giving, the inside board for Walter in wire. third. With Uncle Walter in fourth. Battery by the fifth with Trevor Ball. They're both seven from Kenny, my boy. He's beating a half mile from home here in the Louisiana Derby. Tom Gunner is next to the high horses. And outside. Looking to Jane Brown, with three points for Sater. Mo Tom is up one spot. Conquest Bindi City drops back to last. There's still Candy, my boy, with three for longs to go. The half mile is 48 and one for seconds. Gunrunner right there, moving now. Gunrunner coming to take down Candy, my boy. Dazzling jumping, Britton. Trevor Mo on the front outside. Dean Brown now to the inside as Tom's ready. He's moving past the quarter pole. Three quarters are coming to call in four for seconds. Gunrunner has fortune front there. Candy, my boy. Motown Kirby inside. Motown checked again. Motown in tight quarters at the fence. On the outside, Forever Mo and Dazzling Jam. Motown got stop hard. It's Gun Runner. Gun Runner with Laurel Giroux. Third to the finish of the Louisiana Derby. Gun Runner wins. Going away. Ham's ready was second. Full up for third between Dazzling Jam and oh, it was hard luck in the Wolves again for Motown. Standing outside the bar Life is not tried, it is merely survived If you're standing outside the bar Standing outside the bar Standing outside the bar Life It's amazing the pictures you can find on Facebook. <laughs> it's hard to believe that, you know, I've always said a, a lot of times it's a family-oriented sport, but you grew up going to the races with your dad, and you knew really quickly, this is what I'm meant to do. Yeah, I um, grew up close to Churchill, and uh, my father and a, friend, uh, a friend's father would take us to the races on the weekend and just, you know, kind of fell in love with it from an early age. and Not the gambling end of it, just, uh, I guess, the competitive side of it. You wound up becoming a hot walker. How did you inquire about a job did you just go up to somebody when they came out of the paddock and say how do i how do i get back there well a, fr a friend of uh, of mine his dad worked on the backside so we were <laughs> sorry <laughs> we were um I, I had access to the backside with with uh, my friend's uh, father he was an exercise rider so he got us a job back there so after high For school Churchill, after high school he, he that's right he grew up a couple of blocks from churchill so it was quite convenient after high school, he became an assistant trainer, first for Jimmy Baker. Then you went to the University of Dallas Stewart. <laughs> yeah, we spent a, I spent about four and a half years with Dallas and, um, you know, good program. Teach you a lot about organization with horses and, you know, uh, managing a large number of horses, I guess, would be the, the biggest thing you learn in that program, which, you know, it's the, obviously, work for D. Wayne Lucas and, you know, so many people have come up under that um, University. <laughs> so, for so. those of you that, that don't remember, Dallas Stewart came up, was one of the many successful trainers that came up under D. Wayne Lucas. So, basically, when you come up under Dallas Stewart, you come up under D. Wayne as well. Yeah, to some degree. Um, you know, that they, um, a lot of organization and, um, you know, they, they, they do a good job. Horses always look well and um, that's, that's the big thing, taking good care of the horse and Stuff like that. So, 2004, goes out on his own. He started racking up wins and earnings very quickly thereafter. You combine forces with Midwest thoroughbreds. Explain what a private trainer means and entails. Well, private means you're uh, private, you know, you're, you're training for one person. Now, there's a couple guys here that do it, or no one that I know of, uh, that, you know, the trainer's, 
restricted to just training for the owner, um, kind of work as a team together. But most stables here probably, well, I guess pretty much all of them are public, you know, if they'll take horses. I'm not going to say for anyone, but, um, you know, they're, they're what we call public stables. At one time I was private for Midwest for about a year and a half. So a lot of times there's probably a little bit added stress when you are a private trainer because just like any organization, you can part ways. And that that's a lot of times inevitable either due to difference of opinions or just ready to go your own way that happened. And is there a little bit of added stress because when you go your own way, you've got to rebuild your stock. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, private has its pros and its cons. There's no doubt. Um, you know, if you got to... Obviously, if you're private, you have all your eggs in your one bat in one basket. If you drop the basket, all the eggs break. But but being public, you know, it's it's like you're just more diversified. Just like this, you know, having all your stock and all your money in one stock as opposed to uh, being diversified in the stock market. So you know, I guess maybe at the end of the day, you probably want to be a little more diversified. I guess it just depends on who you're private for and what you know how successful. Uh, how successful you are with the private trainer but uh, personally I mean I, I like being diversified and, and having a public stable and acquire different types of horses and lots of times you'll get owners that prefer turf horses or so, you know obviously here at Oaklawn you, you most of your owners prefer dirt horses when you're looking to claim or buy two-year-olds or yearlings or whatever you're in the market for. Now you certainly have a gift of claiming horses and also moving them up successfully in class currently a 21% rate first off the claim. I'm very, I always note that in the paddock when I select your horses in the races that I do, always very successful first off the claim. Now, without giving away all of your secrets, what are some of the things that you look for when you claim a horse and what do you attribute that, that high percentage rate to? Well, the, when you're looking to claim, I guess, I guess you're looking, probably the main thing is where you're going to run the horse back if there's going to be a race down the road. Even if the horse, there's lots of times a horse can actually win a race. Um, when you're claiming, they could actually win the race and maybe be worth less after the win because they lose the condition. So you kind of got to do your, you have to kind of, I guess, do your homework, know know what you're going to, where you're going to go with the horse, and win or lose. Second. Yeah, lots of times, <laughs> you know, if it's a condition race, you hope they run second, um, save the condition for you yourself but um that that's the that's the one thing um the first thing with claiming that's obviously when you're trying to acquire the horse through the claim box the second thing as far as mo trying to move a horse up which you know there's a lot of horses we don't move up that you know uh, that we have to drop or or um, run at the same level there's some that do move up those are the ones you like obviously but i guess the biggest thing is you know um they're all individuals you um you, you know, some of them you can do a little more with as far as training them, um, and some of them, you know, you, you're not you're not able to do as much because there could be a, you know, some issues the horse has, or so you you might have to you know not not train as hard. So they're they're definitely, you know, horses are are very, they're all different. Every one of them, there's no two alike. Um, they're similar, but they're not. There's no two alike, and you got to kind of get in tune with what the horse wants and and what they'll allow you to do with them of the mornings as far as training. Um, so, you know, like I go back to some, some of them allow you to train on, on them a little harder. Therefore, they are probably going to be a little fitter in the afternoon as opposed to ones that won't take a lot of training, you know, could run out of fitness in the afternoon. Now, the last couple of years, your numbers have gotten so big. You've, you've had to have multiple barns operating simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the key to staying organized? I'm sure working for Dallas you know, taught you a few tricks of the trade. <clears throat> what are some of the, the things that you do to kind of stay organized? Well, it's all about help. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I have an a, a assistant here, Jorge Abreg, who's been with me who's going on in eight years. Wow. And uh, Rick Giannini, he's at the fairgrounds now. He's currently at Churchill. We'll go over to Keeneland. He's been with me the last three winters. He's, he's actually full-time now. So, um, we um we it's it's all about having staff. I mean, when you grow, you gotta not only do you're adding horses, you're adding employees, and you gotta have someone to you know command the ship. And those guys do a great job. Believe me, when I'm when I'm in Louisiana, I don't worry about a thing here, um, or Kentucky. And when when I'm here, I don't worry 
about a thing going on in Kentucky where, you know, obviously this day and age with video and, and cell phones and stuff, it's very easy to, you know, I'm 500 miles away, but I still get to watch a horse work through a, through a cell phone. It's kind of amazing, really. <laughs> and GoPros and all yeah, that good stuff. So you don't miss out. So now in 2014, Brad's barn accumulated 10 graded stakes, four already this year, ranked in the top 100 for wins and earnings in the nation in 2014 and the top 50 last year. Do you go into the year setting goals for the barn or do they just kind of happen? Uh, yeah, no, there's no doubt there's goals. I think you have to have goals in this game and a plan. Um, but, you know, it, it, every year it's the idea is to get a little better. I mean, I don't set a number, but um, I think we had 98 wins last year. So, obviously, the goal this year is to exceed that number. Um, in earnings, I don't remember what the earnings were last year, but hopefully we'll pass that, the goal is to pass that. But, you know, we, we kind of do things. I'm kind of like a monthly. It's kind of weird. I'm kind of like a monthly guy. I try to win X amount of races a month, um, try to whatever last month, whatever we won last month or the last few months, try to, you know, definitely keep it in that area or, or you know, that number. But um, and, and earnings, earnings is a big thing. I learned long ago dealing with Midwest and some other other, other earn, owners that the, the biggest number is not the win percentage or or, um, or in the money percentage. It's earnings per start. That's what pays the bills. Yeah. And um, that's, that's probably the biggest number to look at is earnings per start. Now, I know a very special horse to you is Chocolate Ride. He gave you four graded stakes wins at the fairgrounds. And one of the videos we saw was the grade three fairgrounds handicap. He had back-to-back -back wins the last two years. What's next for him? Um, he'll either go in the, um, the Woodford Reserve at Churchill on Derby Day or the Dixie, I believe it's the the Dixie at Pimlico on the 21st of May or the Louisville Handicap on the 21st of May. So he's got, we've got, you know, some, um, we've got, you know, three races picked out. We don't know where we're going to go quite yet, but he, he the, the Louisville Handicap's a mile and a half. He's never been that far, but we've kind of wanted to try him, so we'll see what happens. How many horses in your barn right now, Brad, overall? Uh, I have 60 right now. How do you keep, like, I could probably pick any horse in your barn and you would say, Two with a van, six furlongs, Oakland on the 15th. And how do you keep all that? It's, it's amazing to me how trainers do that. Well, not all of them do. <laughs> well, that's true. The better ones do it. No, but, like, I can ask my husband the same. And it's just. Um, now, if I asked you your wife's birthday, would you know that? Yeah. Okay. 1382. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you got to be in tune with your horse. I think most of these guys that win. Um, they, they know exactly what, you know, what they got, um, and where the horse belongs. I mean, just because a horse is eligible for a condition doesn't mean the owner's not twisting your arm to run it in another right. spot. But, um, I think most of the time the trainer's going to want to run in the spot where they can make money and get a win pitcher. Okay. All right. Now, another a special mayor that I've mentioned a couple times today is by a co winner called Pat. And what we saw in the video when she scored her third graded stakes win, first grade two, in the Azari beating champion, Untappable. Now, typically a prep for that race is the grade one Apple Blossom. Now, Colpat actually competed in that race last year, running fifth, Untappable one, running second in the Azari like she did this year. Now, she really does seem to be on an upswing compared to last year. Now, she has solely competed in graded stakes company since August, hasn't been worse than fourth. Now, is she kind of on that upswing? Oh yeah, there's no doubt she's better this this winter than she was last winter. I mean, I, I think we probably caught untappable. I'm not going to say on an off day, but you know, was she 100? percent Probably not. But this mare's really improved. Um, I mean, she's a lot better this year than she was last year. Um, we've kind of figured her out. Last year we we didn't really you know, we you know we try to put her up in the race. One of the Philly mare races here, I forget which one it was. Maybe the Bayacoa. Um, she was on the lead, which she does not want to be. Uh, close to the lead, or, or if she does, if the jock puts her on the lead, she just doesn't finish. So she's she's a mare that has to be completely taken out of the race um, and just come with one run, and she's been very successful doing that. So that'll be an interesting rematch yeah, I mean, for the she, third time. She worked yesterday morning. She worked extremely well, and she'll work again next Friday or Saturday, and yeah, hopefully um, you know, she can run that mare down again.
a lot of talk this time of year is focused around the three-year-olds, especially here at Oaklawn. Dazzling Jim did gallop earlier today. How early in the year and even the latter part of the two-year-old season do you determine that a horse has, quote, derby potential? Well, you know, th this colt surprised me first time here winning. Um, I, we liked him, but we, when we knew he, we figured he wanted two turns, um, so we run him two turns first time. He did surprise me winning first time out because we did not have the screws tied at all on him. But and, and he, sh he beat a really good horse that day, American Pioneer, Wayne Catalano. So, um, it, you know, right then we thought, okay, well, maybe this horse is a, a serious horse. And, um, you know, we nominated him to the Triple Crown. Um, then, you know, he come back and he, he ran a really good race here, breaking from the nine hole in this first level allowance. Um, Jock used him a little bit to get position around the first turn, chase him, you know, half mile and 47 and, and kind of got lost a little bit around the far turn down there. And Jock kind of slapped him, hit him, hit him with the whip and he responded and, and kicked on and run down uh, the horse of Wayne's gray sky. But, um, now he's a nice colt. I mean, is he a Kentucky Derby horse? Mm, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> like you know, there's been horses that that win uh, the Kentucky Derby that are probably in the same position that we are in right now. So, um, you know, if you, if you got a chance um, to, to run in run in the Kentucky Derby, you know, you never know when you're going to get a shot. So right now we're kind of looking at that. We don't know what we're going to do to to get him there. We don't know if we're going to um, run him back here in the Arkansas Derby or, or the Northern Spur or, or where we're going to go with him. We're just going to let him kind of tell us where we're going. So we did see him run third in the Louisiana Derby. He accumulated 20 points towards the leaderboard in the Kentucky Derby. He's currently at 17th, but there's a lot of Derby preps still headed towards the first Saturday in May. So he did mention American Pioneer, who was a very impressive maiden winner just a couple of weeks ago. He also after that maiden win, did supplement towards the Triple Crown. So there's also a lot of talk towards him competing in the Arkansas Derby. So a lot of three-year-old talk right now, but talking, keeping on the three-year-old trail, sending him to the Louisiana Derby, mm -hmm. what were your thoughts after that race? Did you see what you needed to see? Um, well, I found out that he's going to fight. I mean, he, you know, if, he, if he's... You know, he got bumped around at the top lane by Forever Mo, and he, he battled with him all the way down the lane. I mean, it looked, you know, obviously at the top of the lane in that race, I don't, you guys watched it, the horse of, of at Steve Asmussen's was long gone. But, you know, he had to fight on to be set, uh, third. Um, the horse of Tom Amos has had a little trouble. But, no, this is a very lightly raced colt that we think a lot of that, you know, should get better with, the, you know, a few more races and, and continue to get better maybe throughout the year. So, you know, he I don't know if he's a Kentucky Derby horse, but I do think he's a horse that can compete in the Iowa Derbies, the Super Derbies, Ohio Derby, stuff like that. And, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of uh, see how he trains over the next few weeks, and that'll determine his next start. So I'm going to let this tractor go by real quick. As I mentioned earlier, Brad did saddle the winner yesterday in the feature Weiss Till. He was a perfect Four for four going into the race, the Arkansas Breeders. He had won those four races at six furlongs. Yesterday's feature, the Arkansas Breeders, was at a mile and a sixteenth, a distance he had never tested. What did you, was it just a, uh, let's just see if he can go the mile and a sixteenth. What What did he show that you said, let's give it a go? Um, well, it was against restrict. I mean, it was restricted to Arkansas right. bread. So, I mean, that that was the reason behind doing it. Um, there, you know, the horse. He never really. He's really fast. I mean, he always natural you know, speed. Yeah, he has natural speed. So, you know, we we're trying to, you know, try to trying to get him to slow down a little bit, which he did yesterday with Joe Rocco. Slow down a little bit. Um, he's. I don't think there's any doubt he's a better one turn horse. We'll we'll shorten him back up to one turn. Um, and, and maybe try the grass with him. But, the, you know, yesterday the pressure, me and the owner talked about it, the pressure was off. We were just kind of, you know, see what happens. It was a good know. opportunity yeah, to try Yeah, it was it. a great opportunity to try him long. And, you know, I think we saw enough that, I mean, yes, it was a great race, but, we, you know, if he's going to compete against open company, I think it needs to be around one turn. He's a, yeah. he's a little better, better, faster horse around one turn for sure. Maybe a one-turn mile race? Um, Not a lot of tracks that have that. But. Yeah, Churchill offers that, but we'll probably look at running him on the grass. Um, we, we tried to get him on the grass last year at Indiana, 
um, five eighths of a mile and it come off and run the race in the mud. We were going to give him a break and point for this meet anyway, regardless. So we run we run in the five eighths race at, in Indiana and. Um, you know, the, all along we've we've wanted to get him on the turf. Obviously, you can't do that here. He's a Rockport Harbor, which um, he's not around any longer as a sire. But he he had a, some grass progeny as well as um, he's out of an elusive quality mare, which he was he was a world record holder at one time for a mile on the grass. So he does gra have grass pedigree in him, and there's a lot of things he does, subtle things he does, training and working that um, that make me think he that that he'd run on the grass. And and Joe Rocco's set rode him the last three races and. First time he rode him to come back, he said, this is a grass horse. So. <laughs> Turf foot. Yeah. There you so. go. Now let's talk about a horse that none of us have seen here by the name of Financial Modeling. Mm -hmm. He's a new acquisition to the barn. Mm -hmm. He ran fifth last out in the Don Handicap. He's a private purchase mm -hmm. for an undisclosed amount of money, which usually means a lot. <laughs> now the group behind you, I believe, is the group from Memphis mm -hmm. that are is the group of owners. He's going to be working first after the break. How far is he going to go? He's going to go five eighths. He's going to go five eighths of a mile. And this is a prep, a work prep for the Oakland Handicap. Tell us about this horse and yeah. the group of owners. Yeah, it was a per private purchase um, for 10 Strike Racing. It's a group based out of Memphis that's run by um, Marshall Graham and Clay Sanders. And uh, they they have horses with Chad Brown and had horses with him in the past. And... Um, um, Liz Crow that does some, does their bloodstock work, um, brought the horse to him and they look really good on paper and, and, um, you know, he passed a physical exam and everything. So, um, he was purchased, he running, he was fifth, I believe in the Don handicap and, uh, they shipped him back to Belmont. Um, and, you know, we, um, acquired him, shipped him down here. I guess it's probably been a, around a month ago and he's been working really well here he's gonna work five eights after the break like nancy said uh point for the oakland handicap with him um previous the race before the the um don handicap he won the queens queens county at aqueduct going a mile and a so he's a street sense he's a big pretty horse um big long stride on him and he'll work here after the break and do we have a pilot uh assigned for this horse for the oakland handicap uh not yet we're just going to kind of you know, see who ships in maybe for some other races and stuff like that. Now, you've had some really solid jockey-trainer combinations. How do you pick the horse to the jockey? Um, so I guess really the only thing you really look at is if a horse has a lot of speed. There's probably some jocks that are a little better on a speed horse as opposed to um, horses that come from out of it. Like Joe Rocco, uh, he does a, seems to do a great job on horses that come from out of out of it with the call pad obviously but i mean you know he, it's it's also i mean he did a great job on we steal yesterday and he was on the lead so you know it, most jocks are can do whatever but i really like a horse that you need to relax on uh with with joe rocco are there any quick questions for brad because he's i'm going to let him go early because he's going to go watch this horse work first after break are there any questions for brad cox yes, yes sir brad yes sir Good. What's the entry fee for the Arkansas Derby? Um, well, um, it's a million dollar race. I, the Louisiana Derby, it was 5000 to enter and then 5000 to run. Um, I think the Kentucky Derby is 25000 to enter and 25000 to run is the entry fee. But I'm not sure the Arkansas Derby. Yeah. Uh, your horse in the eighth uh, today was off for about nine months. Uh, and, and then uh, coming back uh, has run three times recently. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about it? Is that double hours? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he should run well. We got it. He's getting a little bit of a clash relief today, so we we think he should he should fit in the race. Ran in Houston before coming. Yeah, back. that's right. Yeah, he ran in Houston. He come back and ran here once since then. But yeah, he's doing well. Anybody else? One quick question. Yes, Brad, you're obviously one of the hot trainers yeah. around. I mean, do you get owners trying to? get your services i mean do you pick who you want to train for no no i mean yeah i mean like you said when you're we were winning races people are calling in you know trying to train but um you know you don't really pick pick who you want to train for and who you don't uh if you know someone it just depends on and obviously if a guy calls and he has four or five horses he wants to send you you know as long as you know everything's 
good and it's a good owner, you're going to take them. Um, Especially if they're stakes horses. Yeah. <laughs> the better the horse, the quicker the stall becomes open. But, um, but yeah, claiming, claiming gets watered down a little bit. Um, I know most trainers around here would agree that, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of tough to claim for multiple owners because everybody's kind of looking at the same thing. A lot of people use the Raggison sheets, thoroughgraphs. Um, sheets, uh, daily racing form for buyers, and you know, everybody's kind of looking at the same thing. So, you know, you, you got to be careful getting too many people that want to claim because th then you got everybody wanting to claim the same horse, and then, you know, oh, you want to, you know, so it, it gets it gets kind of tough uh, with the claiming. But, you know, we, we will always continue to claim horses the way I see it, but um, our, our game's definitely changed a lot over the last year with, um, uh, you know, picking up good horses like financial modeling and, and um, you know, call pats. That, 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 show, that shows owners they can trust you with a good horse. And ultimately, that's what you want, good Saturday afternoon horses. Anybody else? Yes, yeah. There's been a whole lot of horses claimed the last couple of years in Oakland. Do you all consider that a healthy environment? I don't, I don't think it's unhealthy <laughs> um it, it, yeah i mean i think i guess it, i guess it's good i mean um for, for racing i mean it keeps everybody pretty honest you know if you run a horse that looks like it's gonna um be claimed chances are it's, you're gonna lose it so um but I, I don't i don't know what what negatives could come from it really anybody else will you point him out please yeah absolutely. he comes on the yeah. track all right, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for our guest, Brad Cox.